And welcome to Paul Mythos. I'm Brian here with Larry and Spencer, and we're going to be discussing Invincible episode number five, titled That Actually Hurts. If you've not hit the sub button or the bell, please do so. Leave a comment, hit the up vote, and this was a really another strong episode. We got um, the origins of Titan. I want to focus on that right now because it, this is how you tell a story, everyone. <laughs> you know, you introduce the character a couple episodes back. You establish their power level, what they're doing. You spend the beginning of this episode building up their, you know, yet again, re- reiterating how strong the character is. But then you show why they're doing what they're doing. You know, we understand that, you know, he has a family. He doesn't want to work for, uh, was it Machine Head? Mm-hmm. Um, we get all that drama. He he reaches out for help with, with Mark. Um, we get a cool debate about what level of superhero should be dealing with what crime, kind of crime. You know, should he even deal with street level stuff or not? I like that. And then we get the ending when he takes out, you know, Machine Head and... Now Titan is the kingpin. It was so badass. It was all self-contained. It was all told, you know, Robert Kirkman is an amazing writer. And it, and this is those moments when you look at other comic book properties and think of them as inferior. Because you look at what he was able, what they were able to pull off with this particular character in one episode. Um, I wanted to get that out because I, when I was watching it, I was just in awe. And uh, what did you guys think of the Titans? Um story and how, how how it was built i didn't remember that's how that happened like i've read the comics and stuff and i did not remember that so when you know by the end when he basically became kingpin and just uh didn't he didn't really intentionally fuck over mark but i think that was always his game plan but i didn't remember that happening and it was so like you said it was so well told in such a brief period of time i it it just gives me hope that you know the boys and amazon and these other streaming services that that do like the the shorter series i like that format better because although i'm sad because it's going to be you know 11 and a half months before i see the next season i like the fact that there's not filler episodes and bullshit episodes to try and fill in the 23 episode arc like it's just a short story they're able to tell their story and then it's over and you know it 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 was this episode was almost standalone like you said it's it told the story and it was over absolutely and yeah that's another good thing like you said every episode feels significant and there's even little significant things in there that people that aren't familiar with the books don't know are significant yet but definitely are you know uh and uh you know like you said it was all important it was a good way to tell that origin and you know i I too i knew the character came back in some capacity i knew the character was significant i just didn't know it was he was a a kingpin of any kind until you know until the plan went down and you know isotope showed back up and i was like oh yeah right he did do this because you know that was way back in like what volume one of invincible yeah yeah but overall very well done and you know like i said there's a lot of little significant things in there too that a lot of people may have missed i I like the discussion about like what a hero should focus on there's the moment where you know mark is basically explaining to his dad that he wants to help titan and you know deal with the situation and he's ex- you know he gets the whole layout of how the crime works in the city and just how things are done but with machine head and his dad is like yeah that's you know that's street level stuff who cares we fight aliens we stop asteroids and and it, within the comic book world they do divide up comics you know in terms of what heroes fight what what kinds of enemies And I thought it was an interesting little discussion and debate almost within, you know, very meta of like, well, he is like a Superman. Why, why can't he do everything? Why not deal with the street level and the big things? Why can't he do it all? And and I, you know, they touch on it. It's just yet again, another cool thing that this show does is it examines um, all the different angles of, of just comic books in general. Well, yeah, because you look at someone like, punisher or daredevil whose stories i i love but they're not going to fight ultron or thanos or any of those kind of people it's they're dealing with the more street level type thugs but 
why couldn't Thor or one of those other kind of characters come down? Or like you said, Superman, why couldn't he come down and deal with them as well? I think that it, uh, his mom brought up a good point. It's like, if this is important to you, do it. She left it up to him. And I think that that is a important character moment for Mark. Well, yeah. And you know, the thing that she says, you know, like helping people is never beneath you. Cause you know, you do look at some issues of things. Like if you fought, if you saw a Superman fighting a certain character, you'd be like, well, this, you know, isn't the sort of thing I want to see Superman do. This character is street level. It's like, but it would make sense. You know, even the sort of thing makes you think, you know, is, uh, is Superman a bad person for letting the Joker exist? You know, Bruce, uh, Batman does all this stuff to stop the Joker when Superman could literally just swoop down and put him in jail. Well, Same that thing. story is ex- is um, examined in. Uh... Oh yeah, that that becomes a whole series. In fact, you know but, the fact yeah. that he that he doesn't do it. You know, well, you know that's the whole injustice thing. But it comes back to bite him in that. But uh, is it is it ever examined in Invincible? Do we do we go farther with this? Like Mark doing uh, it, street levels. It, um, uh, there, there are some more street level things that do happen, but the show gets really epic really quickly. <laughs> um, but it does take its time. There are occasions where things slow down, and you 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 dive into other things. There's a there's always multiple layers to every story, and w- the way Kirkman writes is you, you're you're dealing with two or three different plot lines, and two of them you may not even realize you're dealing with until much later. Well, it's one of those things where nothing really is a throwaway. Everything is important, whether it's for developing a character or whether it's something that's happening later or foreshadowing. Everything that he does is very important. And I think that although Mark is way above having to fight, you know, these street level thugs, we were introduced to Battle Beast, who is, you know, obviously. Sh- at this point in time, way stronger than Mark. He, you know, handled him. So, yes, although some of the more street-level kind of thugs that he was dealing with weren't worth his time, he was introduced to somebody who beat him. And I think that that's an interesting point, too, because we're going to see from here on out. uh, His dad mentioned in one of the earlier episodes that every time something happens, you get stronger. So are we going to see Mark come back from this and be significantly stronger because he was almost killed? Or is this something that's going to deter him uh, in the future? Yeah. And that's a good point too, because uh, you know, this, that uh, whole statement about, you know, not viewing situations as beneath you, that may come back to bite battle beast in the end as well, because, you know, while he, you know, just stumped Mark in this episode, Mark's going to be stronger now. So if they ever, encounter each other again you know uh they may be on more of an equal footing i can say slight spoilers battle beast uh is a pretty big mainstay in the comics so yeah i'll leave leave it there (laughs) um in that particular battle you know we have you know mark getting his ass handed to him and then um you know like i said battle beast is wrecking shop he has a crew of, of other villains with him guardians of the globe show up and they get slaughtered. And we have Black Samson and Monster Girl damn near killed in this battle. And uh, Mark as well. Um, I just love the fact that they'll show losing. <laughs> you know, show things go really bad. And Battle Beast just was like, yeah, you know, fuck it. You guys are boring. And he left. Um, but they they suffered. And we also get to see Robot reacting Oddly, with Monster Girl being hurt, he very emotional. Even wonder why. Um, so <laughs> it was all very interesting, and I was, I was, it was, it's so well animated. The artwork in the comic book is so well done, and I love the fact that they're using exactly the style and look and the gore from the comics in in the show. Yeah, they they parallel very well the. Like you said, the gore, the way it looks, everything, it's its just, I don't know. Like it, how to describe how well it translates, I, I don't know how to do that. Because when I was reading the comics, this live action version is even better than what I could have imagined. So, 
Yeah, absolutely. And I was surprised by that too, you know, because, you know, when it was announced that this show would be made, I was, uh, I was wondering how well they pulled off or, or whether they would try to change the art style at all, but it's, it's for, it, it does come off perfect. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's very clean and, you know, like even like, and it's, uh, it's, it's good for setting tone also because, you know, there are some lighter moments and it does a good job of portraying that. But, you know, when things get bloody or gruesome, you know, you definitely feel that, you know, you feel the contrast between that with this, uh, art style very heavily, you know, it, it, whereas certain other style art styles and certain other properties, you know, it, you just kind of expect it and it doesn't seem that significant if you have a, big smackdown draw drawn out brawl like you do in invincible but uh you know here it it feels extra gruesome because of the art style we have some uh we get a brief scene they don't go really deep into it yet but we we see that uh adam eve or we'll just call her eve um is having has a weird relationship with her parents and you know she hates them they're odd they want her to continue to be with rex explode even though he's cheated on her she storms out of the house. She confides into um, Amber later about, you know, just, or no, to Grayson, excuse me, to Mark about how shitty her parents are. Um, we get a little more of that later. Uh, they gave us a little bit here. She's clearly, you know, they th the show is not completely building a, um, it's slightly building a love triangle, <laughs> but it's very subtle and it's very, um, organic it doesn't feel forced and, and i sort of like how they're how they're doing that especially because grayson clearly really likes amber and she really likes him but the strain of their relationship is all focused on the fact that he's never around because we know like a peter parker character now that's straight up peter parker spider-man yeah. always late never there you know they're well, why weren't you here you know his grades are suffering everything is going wrong because he's a superhero but uh, I, I like the dynamic with the three characters, and um, yeah, what do you, do you guys think as far as that? Like you say, it's, it's hard to talk about some of these things because I know where it's going. But <laughs> well, I I draw comparisons. You know, we talk about comics, but you look at how Superman, you know, Clark Kent and Lois Lane got together, but there was always tension between like Superman and Wonder Woman because you have these two super powered beings that are basically doing the same thing. They're fighting. They're on the same schedule <laughs> and, but he wants to be with Lois. And to me, he really wants to be with Amber, but that connection with Eve seems to be more work related, but she's starting to have feelings for him and typical teenage boy stuff. He doesn't even realize it. And I can tell you, because I was one of those at you know, one point in time, that happens all the time. Guys have very little clue when someone is interested in them, especially when they're younger. They have no idea. So it's, like you said, organic. This feels very real to life. Yeah. Yeah, it does. It feels, and you know, it's, um, it's done in a way where you actually you know, kind of care about those relationships and, and, and where they go and are interested in it. I think I'm actually more interested in the show, uh, than I, than I was, uh, you know, in Mark's personal life in the, uh, in the books. I think the show does a great job. There's a few, you know what the show does do, but when it comes to like that side of things and especially Debbie, I'll be right here right now. Debbie is expanded in my opinion, significantly in the show. Really seems in, so. in, in, a, in a really good way. Um, she's always there in the comic, and and things do affect her life in a big way. But the the show gives her time to um, actually feel like not just a a prop, but an actual character. You know, right. And, and speaking of that, she has the notepad and the demon's notepad, and she's she's pretty sure she knows that something's up with Nolan. It, she feels it. She knows it. She doesn't understand it. It's upsetting her, and it, it's sort of the theme of the whole episode. Now she's personally investigating him, and I love the whole sequence of her sending him to different parts of the world to gather food for dinner, and she's able to calculate his speed <laughs> and know how much time she'll have based on his his route and how well she knows him. I thought that was really cool. She knows him that well. Um, 
well, yeah, yeah, go ahead. I got it down to like the seconds. She was yeah. like, going here because I want him to get this is going to take. I just love the little diagram with the map and it's 22 minutes and all this because she would know him. And she mentioned that to him in the last couple episodes that she's like, I'm the one that showed you how humans are, how this world works. You know, she's like, I'm the one that ties you to this basically plane of existence but he's taking her for granted but you know he's showing us that he does really care for her he's not like using her but he gets so caught omni man by the way he gets so caught up in being omni man that sometimes she falls by the wayside but she used that to her advantage because she knows him so well that she was able to calculate exactly how long he was going to be gone and exactly what she could do in that time. Well, yeah, and it definitely seems like there's something real there because, you know, oftentimes, you know, he uh, gets so, like you said, so caught up in being this, um, you know, almost godlike being that, uh, you know, he has a very who cares attitude about most smaller things. And, you know, Debbie seems to be the only thing that sort of grounds him there and actually makes him think you should care. He does a perfect job. The way it's played is perfect because he has that perfect balance, like you said, Larry, of he's trying to be a human, (laughs) but he clearly views himself as superior. And and even though, and you see a breakthrough constantly in the show, like even going back to the first episode, you know, and, and, and the way they play it and his, the, the, the dialogue and every, even the way they animate his face. And the way he looks at things and, and stuff. It's really well done. But he clearly views himself as as something more. Um, now the show's done also a great job of keeping the mystery. We we don't know really what's going on. We saw him kill the, kill the Guardians of the Globe. Uh, it appears as if he's trying to cover his tracks. Uh, the uh, Global Defense Agency are pretty positive he's the one that did it but nobody understands why or what exactly he's doing and i and i love the whole mystery aspect of of this season yeah because even though i know why i don't know that they're going to reveal it the same way because they've already discussed that how the comic book ends which i won't talk about that they want to do it differently so similar to the walking dead show They didn't want to mirror the comics exactly because part of the excitement of this comic book of the walking dead comic book is that no one was safe. So I think that although we have a general idea of what's happening, I think that they do such a good job of setting everything up that it still feels like a mystery to me. And even when she was replaying stuff in her head, when like when he was going to pick up his costume and the blood and all those things, she's, looking over the notes and she's able to connect some dots herself and she's not a hundred percent sure why, but like you said, the global defense agency, uh, they show that they got Mark's blood. So they're trying to figure out a weakness so that just in case Omni man goes off the rails, they know how to kind of subdue him and they haven't been able to figure it out yet. Yeah, I love the whole aspect of analyzing the blood. They're like, you know, how do we kill the cells of a Viltrumite? Yeah. Um, like that, that's just really cool that they're trying to figure it out. And he's like, shit, man, I can't figure out anything. Um, yeah, and how do you do that when you don't even truly know what a Viltrumite is? The only <laughs> thing they know about Viltrumites is what Omni-Man has told them. Exactly. And uh, there's so much yeah, There's so much that I can't wait. Till we, we get in, you know, the show opens up to um, just how, you know, the strength and the power of uh, of Omni-Man. Well, I mean, we, shit, we saw it with the uh, Flaxen episode. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's still the greatest. I've watched that scene so many times. I don't know if that what that says about me, but <laughs> <laughs> he just fucked their whole world up just so easily. <laughs> he flies through. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's so brutal. But the fact that one being could do that is like, holy shit. Um, we we dig more into Robot. So as I said, A, we learn, oh, Robot can fight. You know, we see Robot doing some cool moves. Uh, robot seems to have legitimately be upset with Monster Girl being uh, brutally, brutally defeated 
by Battle Beast. We also find out what exact somewhat of what he's doing. He why did he free the the Mauler twins? He needs their tech. They have this cloning tech and knowledge, and he needs it. We saw him show them a vial of blood, and we know that that blood last week he removed it from Rex Splode. A lot of weird stuff. Um, it's very vague. We don't, you know, what exactly is he doing? Yet again, I know, but it's a cool, yet again, a cool mystery. I like the fact that they're, they're playing off the whole mysteries of, you know, who, who, who are, what is robot doing? What is Omni man doing and why? Um, but yeah, yeah, I like the way they're doing it. Yeah. There's so many little mysteries and, and motives here. And, uh, you know, a lot of it just reminds you of the fact that, you know, just like Mark, the audience is new to a lot of these characters, you know, and, and, in this world and, you know, yeah, we're encountering all these characters. Many of them are supposed to be heroes, but, you know, who can really be trusted? And, you know, who's being a hero for what reason in this world? Yeah, because you don't... The show hasn't confirmed why yet. Uh, and for the Global Defense Agency to put Robot in charge, with as much work as they're doing to keep track of mark and omni man and all this stuff they have to know more about robot than what they're also leading us to believe so are they putting him in a position because what he wants they also want like that is something that i'm curious about too i love the mauler twins uh <laughs> their whole angle of always arguing over who's the original, who's the clone. And <laughs> it's just, I don't, it's stupid, but it is funny. And it is a right. It's a thing, you know, that that's in the comics. And you um, get to see why they never know. Yes. And it's also, <laughs> it's you know, like, oh, of course the clone would, <laughs> my clone would say that. It's, it's like, you're the clone asshole. <laughs> um, uh, my, I only have one more real note. And then if you had a, guys have anything uh the moment where grayson is losing the battle and then there's a moment where it's almost like he powers up a little you know and i think he's you know like fuck you and he he just starts beating the shit out of everyone else now of course that changes but it's clear that he lets his emotions take control and for a moment it seems as he's outperforming what he normally does we've seen a huge range of what he can do, we we get the shot of him kicking the rock by accident and knock, you know, damaging a house. He's very strong. He's not clear exactly how strong. He doesn't completely understand his powers, and that was a great scene to sh to show that um, he's stronger than even he realizes. Right. What? I mean, I I love the Dresden Files, and we've talked about how that is similar in some of the other shows we've seen, but. He mentions that magic is fueled by emotions. So if you're super mad, that gives you fuel to power his magic. But think about that from any like personal things that us normal humans that aren't comic book characters have. If you get super angry, it, you can hit harder because it almost like dulls your pain. Uh, you think of, they always talk about mothers lifting cars to save a baby and like, adrenaline is a real thing so for him to use that emotion to become even stronger could you imagine you know a regular mother lifting a car to save a baby and then multiply that to superhuman levels <laughs> what he would be able to do also let's not forget the uh, super obvious um you know analog the fact that he's going through like a uh a superhuman puberty right now, so he, he doesn't know the limits of his strength. And, uh, you know, he, and better, he better really be careful with Amber then. <laughs> you know, he's, yeah, he's, he, he just doesn't know his limits, you know, and that's the thing. He's, he's growing into this still. He's still growing into this. And, uh, and, uh, he, and often, and he's just not a violent person at all. And, you know, Mark doesn't seem like the type of kid that's been in very many fights or anything. So, you know, he's a, he's an awkward fighter and, uh, you know, doesn't know under, he's just learning how to, you know, properly attack and apply leverage and et cetera. His dad's just teaching him, you know? So, you know, not only that, but he's fairly strong already, even without the rage, just doesn't know how to use it. Or at least it's, 
At least that's how I'm seeing it. Yeah, that's, uh, I agree. Um, little shout out Battle Beast was played by Michael Dorn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is awesome. Um, that's all my notes. Um, I didn't really have a whole lot else to say unless you wanted to talk about Machine Head. I really am like, eh, I mean, we can. I, I like the chip that he used where he was able to basically um, n- proje- project and calculate every possible scenario so he knew they were coming. He knew how to prepare for it. Um, thought that was neat. Uh, Cecil immediately took that shit <laughs> out of his head. He's like, um, I need that. <laughs> yeah. So, exactly. Um, but that was about... Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was saying that he draws off of so many almost like obscure comic book characters like Maverick, who was a almost like a time traveler like Bishop or you know Cable or any of those people. But he used probability to try and change timelines, like to change events that happened. And this is similar. Like he was able to see all the possible outcomes. And that's how he was able to kind of uh, have Isotope in there at the right time and have all the people in there at the right time. And it was all based off of that ability. That's a very, not only just a cool ability, that's could be super powerful and you look at uh what they're going to do now the cecil's has it what is he going to use it for and that's me added another layer of uh mystery we're talking about this show having so many different things going on that we're still trying to figure out what all the things mean now cecil's got his hands on some pretty pretty powerful piece of technology and it's i wonder how he'll use it Yeah, honestly, you know, between the tech and the fact that he has like a little mini Cthulhu and everything, you know, Cecil's got a lot of resources and is a very dangerous individual, you know, which is why I'm imagining why, you know, Nolan, even if being as powerful as he is, is treading as lightly as he is with Cecil because, you know, for all he knows, Cecil may have some means of of stopping him or, or beating him back to some degree. You know, otherwise, you know... Why hide anything? Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, those are my notes. You guys have any other points y'all want to make uh, regarding episode number five of Invincible? We, we're only getting eight, right? I know I asked last week. Yeah, always, yeah. Good. God damn, man. Yeah, I know. Not it's many. So short, right? <laughs> um, yeah. Anything else? Not that I can say without accidentally spoiling something, so no. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing, Larry? Nope. I think we covered everything. Awesome. Um, yeah, we appreciate everyone listening. Uh, we will be back next week with the episode number six review. Um, thanks. Bye. Bye.